So let, let's start. So we want to um, we want to start our study. We're going to do we'll be talking about the abstract of faith. And I think that that's that's a good start for us. I think it'd be good for you that have been in Zion Assembly almost 20 years um, just to like a refresher from the abstract of faith. And I know that the abstract of faith is always um, developing and, and, you know, can, it, it's subject to change throughout uh, the years. The General Assembly, they can add to it, take away from it. You know, because the church continues to grow and continues to progress. Um, and I think it's good for those that are new to Zion Assembly, like us, to get a better understanding, a better picture of what Zion Assembly is all about. So um, I wanted to start with the introduction, and we broke it down into almost 30 slides. So you'll get a copy of it. And we don't, um, uh, we, we're not going to finish the whole thing today. We probably won't even get halfway through it, but this is going to be good for us because you can study it beforehand and we'll study it um, during our, our teachings here. So if you see, as you see their abstract of faith, when the church in the first general assembly was formed in the sense of the guidelines of the assembly, the first thing they said was that the church was judicial only. In other words, uh, we don't make up the laws. You know, the laws are already in the word of God. We we are just here in the multitude of counselors, which is the General Assembly, to search out those laws. And as we began to search those laws out, we begin to and then practice those laws. So it's very important that we understand that when we have the abstract of faith, that many uh, the majority of all of this has been taken from the scriptures, it has been extracted, extracted out of the scriptures, to actively use it today. And when we talk about faith, that word faith is beautiful because when you listen to or when you hear or you read what the Apostle Paul wrote, Paul once wrote, he said, look, he said in, in simple words, he said, I'm Paul, the one that persecuted the faith. And later on, he said that that faith was the church of God. So you come to understand that that word faith, there has a multiple ways of being able to understand the word faith. So, for example, when we talk about faith, you and I, we get excited because we believe, you know, when we talk about faith, we say, well, we have faith that God can do this or God can do that and that God can do great things. And that's understandable. But when we talk about faith in the doctrine, we understand that it also means um, the belief or the faith of the church. The church is the faith. The way that the church or its members were were identified in the New Testament, um, if you read our history, it says that they were identified of those of the way, the way. So that's why when in the early years of the Church of God, when we had different publications uh, prior to the White Wing Messenger, which we're all very familiar with, we had the Way magazine, uh, which was a publication, and that was taken from what Jesus said, that I am I am the way, the truth, and the life. So in other words, what, what I'm trying to say is that when we see abstract of faith, in other words, it's telling us that this is this has been uh, extracted from the word, the faith, the doctrine, the teaching, the traditions of the church, the holy traditions. So we have an abstract of faith, and you'll remember for many years we we had our what we call the 29 Bible truths. You remember that, the 29 Bible truths. And they had a list of everything that we believed in, and they were the general truth. The problem was that um, sometimes when we have a list of teachings this way, we tend to think that that's all the church believes in. And we, we tend to think, oh, well, we only stand for 29 truths, when in reality, the church stands for the whole Bible, rightly divided. So we believe in the whole Bible. So when we say abstract of faith, in other words, it's part of our, this is where our faith is coming from. Now, you'll notice, and, and this is funny because we haven't even gone into the introduction. We're just talking about the title of it, why it's called abstract of faith. Then we have uh, the little writing there that says the following has been accepted by the general assembly. And that's beautiful because right away, we are establishing people and we're letting people know the importance of what we're saying here. It's not saying 
that the following has been accepted by a group of elders or the following has been accepted by a group of committee men or certain men in the church. But it's saying it has been accepted by the general assembly and the general assembly. In other words, it's the highest authority of interpretation of the scriptures. It's so beautiful when you look at the general assembly and you look at the outline of how it's made up of all the delegates. So the leadership, the leadership is there and they serve the General Assembly. They're subject to the General Assembly. The General Assembly together seeks the mind of God and comes to an agreement, an unanimous agreement. I remember a few years ago, we were doing Bible translation conferences in Mexico, and I was speaking to one of the directors that was the main general translator for a Bible called the Peshitta. The Peshitta is a Spanish Bible uh, that was translated from Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, to Spanish. And the only one that's been done in Spanish was done in northern Mexico. And, you know, we were going to a restaurant and I was talking to this brother, the director, and I don't know how the subject came up, but we talked about the General Assembly. And I said, this is the way the church functioned in the New Testament, and this is what we continue to practice today. And the General Assembly being the highest form of authority. And I said that one of the things that is beautiful is that we all come into agreement. And he looked at me and he said, well, Brother Bonilla, he said, I don't, he said, I don't, I don't think that I've ever heard that before. He said, that's impossible that a group of people could come into one mind and one accord. And I said, yeah, it is possible. God can do it and he continues to do it as long as we are willing to let God work this way. So we have the abstract of faith here and everything that we're going to read in it has been accepted by the General Assembly. So in other words, the church has come into agreement in unity. And then it says it's been accepted in proper order, that is by agreement in one accord. It's so important when it says that in one accord. So in other words, that simply signifies to us also the government of the church. The church is not a democracy. So in other words, it's not the majority rules in the church. You know, in the past, yes, even A.J. Tomlinson said that the General Assembly could make mistakes because we're human. You know, it could but then we go back and we seek God and he helps us to get a better understanding of those errors that may have been made. But then it says here, by agreement in one accord. In other words, when we all find the mind of God, such a beautiful thing to, to see that Zion Assembly is still holding on to that factor. Now, we'll go to the next slide here, okay? So we'll go to the introduction now. We'll talk about the introduction of the abstract of faith. So First, it identifies Zion Assembly, that Zion Assembly is a spirit-filled. So when we're talking mm -hmm. about spirit-filled, it automatically, like right away from the beginning, the abstract of faith identifies us as Pentecostal. And, and I like what Brother Philip said a while back, and it's true. When we look at Pentecostalism, um, there's a lot of different forms of Pentecostalism, just like there's, and I, and I give you this illustration, just like there's a lot of different forms of Spanish. You, you, in the United States, the Spanish that is spoken here in California is very different from the Spanish spoken in Mexico. So, for example, in California, people speak Chicano. Chicano is a, a person that is a mixture of American and Mexican. So his Spanish is a Spanglish. He mixes all his words. Uh, where when he says, uh, go with me to the Marqueta to get a, a, a piece of pan. So what is he saying? Just go with me to the market to get some bread. But he's mixing all his words. You go to Mexico, Mexico, they will say it's totally different. You go to uh, South America, they speak Spanish different. Um, so what I'm trying to say is there's a mixture of that. But if you want to learn real Spanish, you got to go to the motherland, to, to Spain, and speak Castellanos. They don't even call it Spanish. They call it Castellanos. What I'm saying is there's a mixture. So now when we talk about spirit-filled community of Zion Assembly, we have to identify, and I love this identification that was given by Brother Phillips a while back, that we consider ourselves in Zion Assembly classical Pentecostal. So you can write that down. So when somebody tells you, well, you guys are a Pentecostal church, say, yes, we are, but we are classical Pentecostal. What does that mean? 
from 1960 or 1950 and 60 to our modern time, there is a different type of Pentecostalism that had that begun to be practiced called charismatics. And the charismatics are very much different. You'll um, you'll see Benny Him takes off his uh, suit jacket and begins to hit people and they all fall on the floor. Uh, you know, uh, practices in Africa today where they have holy water and they sprinkle on people and they start speaking in tongues, supposedly. So it, it's just craziness all over the place. It's it's crazy. We and and it's sad because. It's like the the illustration. You go to Walmart, they treat you wrong, and automatically you think that all Walmarts are the same. And you tell everybody, oh, they're all the same. So you go to a Pentecostal church, and you see like a charismatic church shouting and jumping and getting all crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You can look at it on YouTube. There's this guy who starts singing, and then he gets so hyped up, and he jumps into the baptismal pool in <laughs> service. <laughs> and... You look at it and you're like, what in the world is going on here? And people automatically identify that with all Pentecostals. And they say, oh, you're a Pentecostal. I don't want to go to your church. Y'all speak in tongues. Y'all are crazy. Y'all jump around. Y'all do this. Y'all do that. When in reality, we can now tell people, no, we are, those are charismatics. Those are hyper Pentecostals. We are classical Pentecostals. And you say, well, what does that mean? That there is a balance in what we have. Not only do we teach and we emphasize in the teachings of Christ and the apostles and the word of God, but we also believe that the Holy Ghost is a is is a gentleman. He is he works a, in a very orderly way. The Holy Ghost is not going to do anything to make you shout and then hurt yourself. You know, the Holy Ghost is is very organized in the sense that if the Holy Ghost comes down in a service, you, you can feel that it's God's power that is present there. Nobody needs to jumpstart the Holy Ghost. Nobody needs to to start uh, making people scream just to get the Holy Ghost. No, when the Holy Ghost is present, he's present. And when he wants to move, he'll move. All we have to do is be willing vessels to let him use us. So when we see there that right away, the General Assembly decided that when we have this abstract of faith, we want to identify ourselves at that moment as spirit-filled. We want people to know that. So Zion Assembly, it says here, is a spirit-filled community. So in other words, a brotherhood, um, a, a body of Christ, committed. So what does that word committed mean? That we uh, we have taken a stand to uphold. So when we have been committed, we are we're upholding we're dedicated to what? To the presiding bishop's teachings? No. We're dedicated, it says here, to Christ's teachings. So right away it says Zion Assembly is a spirit-filled community committed to Christ's teachings. That's wonderful. That right away we can identify Zion Assembly with being not only classical Pentecostal, but being committed to the teachings of Christ. And I think that when, for example, when A.J. Tomlinson spoke to Brother Sperling on that day of 1903, Brother Sperling took the notion away from me that the church was invisible. And he was able to identify the visible church and the invisible kingdom of God. That moment he identifies it. This is why A.J. Tomlinson at that moment said, well, well, I want to be a member of this with the understanding that it is the church of God of the Bible. Because he was able to understand that. So when people see Zion Assembly, they'll know we're a spirit-filled community committed to Christ's teaching. Classical Pentecostalism identifies us with not leaning too much to the right or too much to the left. Because that helps people identify that Zion Assembly has a balanced message. What has kept Zion Assembly on that route? It has been that it's been anchored on the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost has anchored it in the middle. So, and, but, you know, we're not done yet. The rapture hasn't happened yet. So the enemy, the enemy is going to attack Zion Assembly as he always has done it. He's going to attack the church. Why? Because he wants us to lean to the right or lean to the left. Remember, lean to your own understanding. But no, the Bible says to lean on his understanding in a balanced message. 
So when we see Zion Assembly and people ask us now, what are you guys? We are a classical Pentecostal church. We we are the church and we believe in the teachings of Christ and we believe in to con we believe that we want to continue to preserve those teachings of Christ. And then let the spirit give a divine witness of who we are. The spirit that is working within Zion Assembly. So that is why it's so important for us each local church, each leader to fight to preserve that spirit because the enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to distract us from what we've been committed to do. To do what? It says you're committed to Christ's teachings. And if he tries to do that, he can sway us one way or another. And he's very deceptive today the way he's doing it. But if we stay anchored to the Holy Ghost, he's going to continue to lead Zion Assembly. So I really like that, that right from the start, the abstract of faith, Let's us know we are a spirit-filled community committed to Christ's teachings. Isn't that beautiful? So if somebody were to ask you, you know, when I when I share about the Museum of the Bible, they I was sharing in a in a interview a few days ago, and they said, Nathan, tell us tell us about the Museum of the Bible. And the first thing I said, look, I said, the Museum of the Bible, one of our missions is that we are here because we want people to experience the transformative power of the Bible. So if they were to tell me, Nathan, tell me about Zion Assembly. Well, Zion Assembly is a spirit-filled community committed to Christ's teachings. Right there, right there and there, it tells you we're classical Pentecostal and we adhere to all the word of God. Because when we say Christ's teachings, we're talking about the Old and the New Testament. Because Jesus said, I come to not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law to give you the true meaning of the law so he's talking about the old and the new testament so when we say christ is teaching we're talking about the whole bible so we're spirit filled we believe in god leading us but we also adhere to all the bible that's why i love our forefathers used to say uh that the church of god was the bible rightly divided that's beautiful remember when paul said rightly divided he's using an illustration of his own profession he was a tent maker and those that have sewn together pants or shirts know that if you don't cut that correctly, and when you begin to put it together, it's going to be a mess. And Paul knew that those, they had to be cut exactly the way on each side of that tent to be able to stand firm. That's what Paul is saying. When we rightly divide the word of God, we are cutting the word of God. We're rightly dividing it. So when it's time to stand, the word of God will stand firm as we will stand firm with the word.